since the Titan submersible imploded about two weeks ago, there have been emails uncovered between the CEO of OceanGate, Stockton Rush, and his former friend, Carl Stanley. And I think those emails reveal a lot about Stockton Rush's character. Carl Stanley is a submarine expert and he was gonna go with Stockton Rush down in the submersible on its third trip, but he didn't manage to go down. You can see him here in the footage. Uh, and that was because there was something wrong with the submersible. And maybe it was after that experience that he sent the email telling his friend that he didn't think it was safe. Let's have a look at an email that Carl Stanley sent to Insider magazine, where he gives his view on his friend's behaviour. Here's what he said in the email. When he cancelled what would have been the first year's dive season 2019, he told a lie that it was due to electrical issues in the sub from a nearby lightning strike. Maybe laymen were fooled by that, but to anyone with technical knowledge, we all knew that was a lie. Once you realise he could make up such lies, you start to question everything. I am very curious to see how much testing he actually did. I suspect it's going to be shockingly small. I've never seen proof of any except the dive I was on. The time frame he did this all on was beyond any common sense. He was willing to take people out to the middle of the North Atlantic when he had done only four deep dives and probably not even one without a major system failure. I am beginning to wonder if he was suicidal. There's a total of five missions. We're mission number three, but the first two missions, they weren't able to dive down on the Titanic due to weather conditions. And also the Titan, the submarine, I guess something happened when they were towing it back. A ghost net got wrapped around it, broke a lot of stuff. They're just double checking everything right now, making sure everything's safe. This is footage that was taken at the same time as Carl Stanley was on the boat ready to go out in the Titan. It was taken by Jake Queller, the YouTuber who was on board and um, he had also planned to go down in the submersible but the trip was cancelled because of the issues with the Titan. I'm going to put a link to his video in the description. It was very sad and really sensitively done. And now something that Carl Stanley wrote to Stockton Rush. There comes a time logic has to overrule impatience. The evidence suggests there is an issue or defect in one area. Without knowing what that defect or issue is, your models and experts cannot say how it will affect the performance of the hull. Rush admitted he was actually personally offended by Stanley's doubt about the submersible. And, yeah, Kyle, can you give me a little, let's give a little rundown here. Yeah, there's orange two halves there, kind of the sphere. There's one on either side. That's kind of what we're focusing on right now. They're the brains. So inside the pod are motor controllers, uh, a switch, some power supplies, some relays. And so it gets data from the sub and it was not um, consistently communicating. He told him, keep your opinions to yourself. He also said this, your recent emails tell me that we have two fundamental misunderstandings. The first is regarding your role while visiting us in the Bahamas. I value your experience and advice on many things, but not on assessment of carbon fiber pressure hulls. Rush added the second, even more disturbing misunderstanding. So that suggests the first is very disturbing. <laughs> is your concern that I will either intentionally or unintentionally succumb to pressure and take advantage of our clients? I realise more than anyone that this is the primary pitfall and have taken multiple steps to guard against this. As someone who has been on the receiving end of uniformed accusations from industry pundits, I hope you of all people will think twice before expressing opinions on subjects in which you are not fully versed. This is an experimental sub. People are informed that it's very dangerous down there. Am I spinning? Yeah. Oh my god. One of the thrusting forward, one of the thrusters is thrusting backwards right now. So the only thing I can do right now is a 360. You know, I was thinking, we're not going to make it. So was Stockton Rush suicidal? So it just didn't seem quite right, to put it bluntly. And that's why I called it. 
Um, but mostly because we've got to find out what this control problem is. That's sort of important, controlling the sub. It's up there with life support. Um, and so we'll be working tonight on that. Um, we're going to go swap the pods and see if we can follow the problem to diagnose where it is. Uh, we have spare control pods. They're not the easiest things to change. So we'd have to pull the sub alongside. I don't get the impression he was suicidal because if he was, why would he be bothering to do any testing? Why would he be talking about trying to sort out a problem and not letting people go that night? It doesn't make sense. So just the plan for today was to do an engineering dive, a test dive to check out some of the systems. First a controlled dive so we'd have the sub on the platform go underwater. Everything checked out, the sub to leave the platform and go for a short dive here kind of close to shore. We got partway through that process, everybody was loaded in the sub, domes closed, everybody's ready to go. And one of the computers, we've got two spheres, two computers that control a lot of the thrusters. And one of them was acting up a little bit. Uh, it was offline, they restarted it, came back online, but some of the functionality wasn't exactly as we'd hoped. Carl Stanley says in the email to Insider Magazine that Stockton Rush has lied. So we had a small window of opportunity for good enough weather to potentially dive on the Titanic. So in the middle of the night, we started heading towards the Titanic and I'll tell you right now, the weather was a bit rough. Throughout the next few days, the team worked on the submarine. So we waited over the Titanic site for a couple days and lo and behold, the weather did not clear up. It got worse and worse and Stockton decided to call it. So why did he lie? Y you would kind of hope that a submarine was able to cope with some waves. <laughs> You know, I don't know what else could be going wrong in the sea. You know, it's either flat or it's wavy. And you would hope that if the weather suddenly changes, a submarine can cope with that. So I don't actually think that what he said in his lie was, was actually very reassuring. If he'd said, there's an issue, we need to subject this submersible to further tests. I don't want anyone to go down until we have done another 20 tests on it or something. Then I would imagine his customers would feel grateful and, and that they would trust that they were in good hands. That it wouldn't actually look bad on him. It would just reassure them that any kind of problem and he was going to be ready for it and he was going to make sure it was solved and that their safety came first. Again, black and white thinking. In his mind, if he was to say that, it would mean he had taken a risk he shouldn't have done and that's bad. And so it just didn't happen. He has to lie about it and pretend it didn't happen. When we made our way in, weather cleared up and Stockton asked me if I wanted to join him on the test dive. The test dive would consist of dropping down to about 3,000 feet deep. I told Mr. Stockton I would love to join him on this opportunity. On that very same trip, not only did he start to turn the boat towards the Titanic again after he decided they must have fixed this massive major fault, but on top of that, and, and, and they didn't actually end up going down because apparently he blamed the weather. <laughs> but on top of that, Stockton Rush was taking customers down to 3,000 feet to test his submersible straight after, you know, on the very same trip as, as he had had to abort the dive to the Titanic because of this major fault. So... He hadn't even tested it once. This was the test, you know, with his customers in it. To put that into perspective, Carl Stanley had emailed Stockton Rush telling him that he tested his own submarines 50 times before he would let people go down in them. And they only went down to 725 feet. It makes me think of like, as if this was just a remote control toy. You know, and he's like, oh yeah, yeah, okay, well, let's fix it, here we go. All right, off you go, have another go. And it doesn't really matter if the toy breaks again. But that, that's what it makes me think of. It's just, it's, it's really incredible. Stanley said, two to seven dives to operating depth are too few to launch an expedition, selling six figure tickets in the middle of the ocean. He compared it to skydiving and he said you need to do 50 test skydives 
in order to get a B license. And again, he talked about his concern about a defect with the hull. He said, I think that hull has a defect near that flange that will only get worse. The only question in my mind is, will it fail catastrophically or not? And Rush dismissed the idea of 50 tests. He even said that testing may just take two dives or 20, he added although he'd already made it clear that he was only planning to do as many as five. The more tests he would have done, the more money he would have had to have paid for those tests to be done. Now, he was a very wealthy man. He was estimated to be worth about $25 million. And he also came from a very wealthy background. So I don't think that those 50 trials would have been a real problem for him financially. I mean, you could say, yeah, but he was greedy. He still wanted to save the money. But I think that even that wouldn't have put him off if he was worried that otherwise, you know, he might kill people <laughs> and himself. So there was something else stopping him from testing his product more. There was something stopping him from being more careful. It wasn't just what he was telling other people. You know, nobody needed to know how many tests he'd done. So it wasn't about what I talked about earlier, about how he blamed the weather and pretended the product was fine. It wasn't about that. It was about him not wanting to do those tests himself. You know, even if it was totally private, he didn't want to test the submersible any more times. The only explanation I can think of is that he believed it was gonna be okay that he thought that it would take everyone down safely and that there wouldn't be any issues. That he was so sure of this, he didn't believe he needed to test it further. <laughs> so why? Why would he think that way when every time it seems he took it out, there was a major failure? Why would he be so sure it was fine? And, and here again, we go into illogical territory and that and so is often the case with human beings you know the way that we perceive things is very often not tied to logic i think the reason he believed that his submersible was going to be fine was because of his need to believe that when we're not being logical it tends to be because we have a need to believe something well i think that again this was about his perception of himself if the submersible was perfect, so was he. If it needed countless tests done, then what was wrong with him? There was something very wrong with him. That even though he could see that it had failed each time, that would have been um, such a painful thing to accept that because of how he viewed himself as, as so much a part of the success or failure of the sub, that would have had such an effect on him that instead he went into denial and, and he behaved as if each major failure was something very small that was very easily tweaked. Some people experience perfectionism so strongly that they can't tolerate the process of making something better because throughout that process, they're having to be faced with the fact that the thing they're working on isn't perfect that it's not okay, it's not good enough. For someone like Stockton Rush, I don't think it helps that he was clearly really intelligent. I mean, he'd gone to um, a really good university. He went to Princeton and he had learned to be a pilot when he was just 19 years old. I think he would have found that first time round, things tended to work out. And um, I don't think that helped. I think that would have reinforced the same problem. I think he needed very much to believe that every time he finished fixing the latest major fault, it was now perfect and ready to go. In reality, of course, the people who are successful tend to have failed lots of times. That's how they learn from their mistakes. That's how they create better products. Um, so failing is a really useful part of succeeding it's not that you're you know you either fail or you succeed it's all part of the package but to stockton rush that isn't the case 
he sees himself, I think, and other people in a very black and white way, where either you are a failure or you are a success. There also seems to be something about control going on, where he has to be in control, doing tests in order to tick boxes for um, you know, other organisations, independent organisations to, to check you know, how safe you are. Well, as I've said, he didn't have to do that, unfortunately. I hope they changed the law. Um, but I think also it would have been about him feeling like he doesn't want to have to do things anyone else's way. This is his project, it's his baby, and he is in charge, he's in control. When he says it's fine, it's fine. So there's something about authority. That's the sense I'm getting, you know, that he views someone as being authoritative when they criticise him. When his friend is saying, you know, you have to put this, you know, you have to put safety before ego. That is, um, you know, that feels like he's being told off. Rush was the youngest of five children. I think that in itself already says something. You know, being the youngest means that he would have had older siblings, probably at some point or other, if not all the time, telling him what to do, maybe being bossy with him. So they all would have seemed like authority figures of some kind to him because they were older than him. So he would have had four siblings older and then his two parents, that's six people potentially telling him what to do. So it kind of makes sense that, um, you know, that there's something about needing to be in control himself, something about um, wanting to forge his own way and not have to um, curtail what he does to other people's expectations and demands of him. If you believe that being perceived as failing means that you are a failure, it will be very dangerous and very threatening for anyone to see you in that way. And so you will do everything you can to stop them from seeing you like that. A narcissist is kind of, their whole life is governed by these illusions. And the people in their lives are expected to go along with the same illusion, you know, and that has to be their reality. And if it isn't, they get loads of negative feedback. They get anger, they get um, thrown out of the person's life or they get bullied or they get, um, you know, it might be a smear campaign about them. And, and this is something that Stockton Rush actually threatened to do to one of his former employees. You know, this person um, had a meeting with him about safety and he was fired straight after that. And the reason he was fired was because he wasn't confident that the submersible was safe. He was told that if he didn't change his story, if he didn't say that actually that wasn't why he was fired, his reputation was going to be destroyed. Narcissists see themselves and others in a very black and white way. So either you're a good person or you're a bad person. Either you're a success or you're a failure. And I think what's happening here is he's seeing himself as bad because he's perceiving that somebody is telling him off. That's, that's how he's perceiving what's happening. So he's being told off for being bad, and so he's bad. And the only way for him to feel good is for him to um, get angry with the person telling him off and decide that that is the bad person. <sighs> he calls what Carl Stanley says disturbing. You know, um, when in reality, it's him that's being disturbing. He's the one putting people's lives at risk. His friend is just trying to warn him and trying to talk him out of it. So this is the only way for him to feel OK with himself is to actually project this bad feeling about himself onto the other person. It's interesting to me that Carl Stanley even tells him that he thinks that if he tries to pull him back a bit that he's going to go for it with even more vigor you know that he's going to be even more motivated to do it if someone's trying to stop him again that speaks of not wanting to be controlled and perceiving 
um, somebody as being controlling very easily. It doesn't take much, you know, just them having an opinion that already feels too controlling. And so it's all about being rebellious. He talked himself about breaking the rules. He quoted General Douglas MacArthur as saying, you're remembered for the rules you break. And I think that was really important to him. You know, he said also that he wanted to be remembered as an innovator. And so he wanted to be one of a kind. You know, he wanted to do things differently to everybody else. And that was what was going to be special about him. If he was going to test each um, if he was going to do all the tests, do everything by the book, then what was unique about that? So I think his need for being special, for beating everyone else in that way, <laughs> by somehow having this perfect thing that didn't even need to, to, you know, he didn't have to jump through all the hoops to create it. I think that was what made him feel good enough. And this is the problem with the mind of a narcissist, is how dangerous that is, not just for the person, but for the people who um, they have an impact on. Of course, in this case, five people died, and it does seem that it was just because of his ego. And, 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 I, and I even wonder if, if he was to have thought of this logically, if he actually would have decided that he'd rather die than play by the rules. Not that he was suicidal, but if it just seemed so painful to him to do everything that he was told to do by rules, that it would have been too unbearable and he wouldn't have been able to do it. He would have chosen danger. So there seems to be a lot to this, you know, his, his denial that there was anything deeply wrong with the product he'd created, um, his need to be thought of as a success um, and how that was tied into him believing he was a good person and him believing that he was a worthy person, how easy it was to knock him off that, for him to start thinking, oh, I'm a failure and I'm bad. And, and the way that he then turned that around and became aggressive and defensive and um, bullying of other people, the way that he risked other people's safety so that he could break the rules and not be, not feel like he was under the control of any advisors, you know, just by taking their advice, it seems. It was also interesting the faith that Jake had in um, Stockton Rush. Long story short, every day they did have some problems and we tried to fix every little thing to make sure everything was perfect for our opportunity to dive on the Titanic. It seems weird now, but at the time it just seemed like an everyday thing in my opinion. So there's something about the way that Stockton Rush comes across that must have felt reassuring. And maybe that was his own, Stockton Rush's own denial his own conviction that everything was fine because he needed it to be so much. And he needed to believe that he was capable of creating this perfect um, machine that, that was safe for everyone. If you feel that you're a perfectionist, that doesn't mean that you're a narcissist. <laughs> it doesn't mean that you're capable of killing five people. But if you, um, you know, if you find that your perfectionism gets in your way, if you feel like you beat yourself up a lot, you're really hard on yourself, and um, and and things are difficult. You you have kind of all or nothing thinking going on, and that can bring you down then you might find my course helpful. It's a course about healing from narcissistic abuse. And, um, you, you know, people can get quite caught up in what that means and whether they were or weren't abused or neglected in any way. But if you struggle with yourself, I still have a couple of places left on the course for the US time zone, and I've got um, also some room on the Europe time zone. So uh, if that interests you and you want some more information, then please send me an email to contact at liveabusefree.com. Anyway, I hope that was helpful. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. Please hit the notification button 
and uh, make sure your notifications are on for YouTube and I'll see you in the next video. If you feel that you struggle with perfectionism, that doesn't mean that you are a narcissist. It doesn't mean that you're capable of killing people because your ego comes first, you know. <laughs> um, but it might make life difficult for you. If you find that you're beating yourself up a lot, that things are just difficult, maybe your relationships are difficult, maybe you're having a hard time at work or a hard time with friends or family or uh, romantic relationships, um, and, and you think that that might be partly down to the way you think of yourself, that you're just so hard on yourself that it makes everything really difficult, then, um, then you might be interested in the course I'm running. 